Uh, good afternoon, I'm Priyanka and on behalf of Manupatra, I extend a very warm welcome to all the attendees and our panelists, uh, Ajay Raghavan, Abhay Raj and our moderator for the conversation today, Suhasini Rao. Uh, many of you would be clued in that 22nd April is celebrated as the Earth Day and this year was the 50th anniversary of Earth Day and thus it is only fitting that Initiative for Climate Action, uh, the co-founders of which I are our panelists for today, uh, with, and Initiative for Climate Action was launched on Earth Day this year. The objective of today's webinar is to start a dialogue around the subject, identify, invite, and to connect with more and more people who are passionate about the planet and climate action, those who see themselves as contributing to the above journey and explore possibilities to contribute to the transformation. This conversation is just a beginning, and Manupatra is happy to be instrumental to be initiating this while we stay committed to take this forward. So I would now request Suhasni to take forward this conversation and uh, I'm sure this is gonna be a very fulfilling one. Suhasni. Thanks so much, Priyanka. Um, good afternoon, everybody. It's uh, good to see our panelists here. And uh, of course, all the participants who are joining us as we speak. Uh, um, as Priyanka has already outlined what today's concept is about, it's going to be a conversation for the next uh, 90 odd minutes uh, with our panelists about climate change, about law, sustainability, and how all of these play a role in our lives, not just as, say, lawyers or legal professionals, but as citizens and people and, and humanity as a whole, right? Um, so a quick introduction to our panelists today. Uh, we have with us uh, both the founders of uh, the Initiative for Climate Change. Um, I'll start with uh, Mr. Ajay Raghwan, who is an alumnus of ILS, Pune, uh, who spent almost, what, close to two decades at uh, Tri-Legal, one of India's leading law firms heading the labor and employment law practice. Uh, Ajay is also the co-founder of the Bangalore Creator Circus. Some of you might be aware of this. It's, uh, it's a movement uh, that is focused around art, science, and sustainability. And it's it's definitely something worth checking out. And I'll, uh, of course, uh, ask Ajay to speak a little bit more about it in the course of our conversation. He's also counted amongst, uh, you know, India's top 100 lawyers. So um, welcome so much, uh, Ajay, and it's going to be a good conversation with you uh, today, hopefully, yeah? And um, before we proceed, I'll also introduce our other panelists. We have with us today um, Abhay Raj Naik. Uh, Abhay is an alumnus of NLSIU Bangalore with a master's in law from Yale. Uh, he is also visiting faculty at Azim Premji University, um, NLSIU and St. Joseph's College of Law at Bangalore for various subjects uh, related to the field of environmental law, field research, ecological justice, and sustainability. Um, Abhay wears many hats, including that of a researcher, consultant, um, mentor, guide, and, and thinker. So looking forward to the conversation today with both of you. Yeah, uh, Just a little outline of today's uh, process. What we're going to start off with is a poll before we uh, just as we jump into the conversation. So in the course of our dialogue today, there are going to be a bunch of poll questions that come up and uh, for our participants. So please do respond to them. It would be good for us to understand also, you know, uh, and get some feedback from you on that. And uh, with that, let's jump right to it. Um, and let's start off with Ajay. Ajay, uh, can you give us a little bit of a background on what climate science actually is? and and you know, help us actually understand where this whole conversation begins from a factual perspective before we move on to its dynamics with how it interacts with the law and other areas, right? Thanks, Hasini. Thanks for that introduction. Uh, and uh, good afternoon, uh, everybody. Um, glad to have, have all of you all here. I think this is a, this is a fairly important uh, sort of, of topic and uh, it's it's nice to see that there are lots of interested people uh, in this particular area. Uh, what I'm going to do is is actually share my screen because I've got a presentation that I'd like to run. Uh, just give me a second. Okay. 
Okay, I'm going to um, sort of, of talk about a couple of things today. I'm going to start, like Sohasni said, with the science. Uh, and from the science, we'll sort of, of then move into the law. Um, I'm going to start with, with uh, this new blockbuster movie that is uh, sort of releasing soon, and it involves some of the greatest actors on the planet. Um, the plot goes something like this. Uh, the movie is called 2030. Essentially, uh, planet Earth has lost a third of all sea life and coral reefs across the world have completely wiped out. Sea levels have risen by six feet and many small islands have disappeared. All major coastal cities, including New York, Mumbai, Kyonzao, and Kolkata are frequently flooding. A third of all animals, insects, and birds are wiped out. The Arctic ice has completely disappeared. There are over 150 million environmental refugees across the planet. There is extreme food and water shortage. Disease and poverty are rampant and a pandemic has got the whole world locked down. The GDP across the planet has taken a significant beating and the world is faced with its worst economic crisis. Now this is, this is um, something that I'd like to sort of come back to. So do keep this, this uh, movie in mind as we go through this uh, presentation. Uh, at some point, I'm gonna come back to this movie and, and we'll talk a little more about it. Uh, in my opinion, I think the most important part of climate action is being able to understand the science. Uh, because without that ability, uh, your, 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 uh, your ability to then go out and actually do something about it is, is limited. So uh, I'm, I'm going to try, and this is one of the challenges with climate science. Uh, the scientists have gone out and put it out there, but they've kept it quite complicated. And I think what my attempt is going to be to try and sort of, of simplify this to the extent that uh, hopefully some of you all uh, who don't completely understand it will, will, will now start to understand it. Uh, so very simplistically, what climate change essentially or global warming is, is, is the uh, sort of release of carbon into the atmosphere that traps a large amount of, of heat in it. In this particular sort of image, what you'll see is on the left is, is what we've been for thousands of years Essentially, the, the sun sort of shines in the day that, ascent, that heats the earth. Uh, and every evening, once the sun goes down, that heat is then released back into sort of, of, of space. Uh, now, the earth works in a beautiful way. What it does is it traps just the right amount of heat within it. And that amount of heat is what makes life conducive to all of us and, and, and to human beings especially. Uh, now, what happens is as you start to increase the amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, Carbon dioxide, just by virtue of, of its properties, traps heat. And the more heat it traps, the more the Earth starts to heat. So in the most simple way, what climate change really is, it's the release of, of carbon into the atmosphere, excessive carbon into the atmosphere, that then starts to heat the, the Earth up in ways that perhaps we haven't fully sort of appreciated. Uh, the, key, the key sort of causes of, of global warming or climate change is really the release of carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. Uh, but there is also sort of other elements that are released that, that are heat trapping gases. All of these are essentially gases that tend to trap heat. So you've got carbon dioxide, which essentially comes from fossil fuel and industrial processes. There is uh, carbon dioxide uh, on account of forestry, uh, sort of, of, of cutting of forests and land use. Uh, there is methane, which, uh, some of you all have sort of, of may have heard of comes from uh, from cows from a bunch of other things, uh, and there are some of the other gases. But but I think to for for the purpose of of the discussion now, uh, we're really going to concentrate on carbon dioxide because that's the signif most significant uh, sort of of gas uh, that leads to global warming. Uh, where does this carbon dioxide come from? And this is this is actually quite crucial uh, in the urban context. Carbon dioxide essentially comes from vehicular traffic. It comes from industries. It comes from thermal plants. Uh, in fact, in India, about 55% of our electricity is still generated through coal. Um, and that's, that's perhaps the, one of the biggest sort of, of, of uh, releases of, of carbon into the atmosphere uh, and through just, construction. So if you look at this. Ajay, just sorry, I'm just uh, interjecting for a minute. 
we are running the first poll for most of our participants so on your screens participants you should be able to see a poll question come up whenever you can just do respond to that it will be good for us yeah back to you ajay please carry on thank you um so just just so essentially i think in in, in a nutshell what what climate change really is is about is the release of of uh, carbon dioxide uh, and certain other gases but specifically the the sort of reason for all of that release is the burning of fossil fuels uh, fossil fuels being sort of broken up into oil uh, coal and gas uh, now why is 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 any of this sort of of critical um now let's talk about carbon dioxide and what it it's sort of been uh, this this uh, is is again a reasonably interesting uh, sort of of um drawing because what it tells us is that for the last 800000 years the amount of carbon dioxide that was present in the atmosphere was roughly at about on an average at about 240 um uh, sort of of uh, parts per, mil per million that sort of lay in the atmosphere and this is thousands of years right for thousands of years we've had atmospheric carbon dioxide remain almost constant with a little bit of sort of movement up and down but by and large it stayed the same for many many years all the way till about 2050 till 1950 which is what you see here uh from 1950 onwards uh and for the next 60 to 70 years the rate of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere has constantly started to move up um and this this if if you look at where we are today we're currently at about 412 parts per million that's almost double of what we were literally 50 or 60 years ago uh, and we've never been in this place before the earth has never had this much carbon within the atmosphere and therefore what does that mean what what does all of this carbon in the atmosphere mean this is what it really means uh, what you see on the left is a graph that records the temperature of the planet and how that sort of of temp and sort of talks about how that temperature has been creeping up um a lot of people talk about temperature and say what is this 1 degree this 1.5 degree this 2 degrees essentially what the temp what what this really means is the average temperature of the earth has remained largely the same for the last thousands of years and that's approximately at about 4, 14 degrees so if you look at it for years we we've, we've had this constant sort of of temperature of about 14 degrees on an average that's recorded and remained constant across the planet um the global temperature record essentially represents that average now that average has started to change from the mid 20th century the average global temperature has been going up year on year since the 1960s currently we're 1 degree more than it has been in pre industrial sort of era so so if you look at pre the 1950s and from the 1950s to to where we are in 2020 in the last 70 years uh we we've, we've essentially the temperature of the planet has gone up so we're approximately at about 15 degrees on on an average across the planet today now a 1 degree global change is significant because it takes a vast amount of heat to warm up imagine the oceans the, the atmosphere land all of this is being warmed up in different ways and that average has now sort of of increased the overall planetary sort of temperature by 1 degree now a 1 degree change in temperature can actually mean 4 or 5 degrees in some other parts of the world so while the constant average is 1 degree that could sort of of essentially mean that in some parts of the world we've got temperatures that have gone up by 4 or 5 degrees in some some parts of the world perhaps it's gone gone up a little less which is actually sort of of leads to the next slide now if you look at this the the temperature and this represents the anomaly or the change in temperature in different parts of the world since the pre-industrial era to where we are now now if you look at the arctic which is right on the top it's showing a temperature difference of close to anywhere between 4 to 8 degrees 4 to 9 degrees in some parts right up here and then if you look at the tropics and the middle area it's sort of that ranges between maybe 2 to 4 degrees in some parts uh So essentially what this is saying is that in in the last maybe 30 to 40 years the temperature of this planet in some parts of the world has changed so dramatically that it's actually not just a 1 degree change in some parts we are talking about maybe 7 to 8 degrees of temperature change and variance from what it's been for thousands of years. But this is perhaps the most important uh 
document in in being at least in the recent past that uh, in, in terms of, of a scientific scientific publication that has gone out and described some of these things uh, and uh, given that a majority of you all in this sort of, of uh, conversation are lawyers i'd uh, i'd i'd urge you all to take a look at this particular report it's it's a very well written report uh, and the genesis for this report was essentially the paris agreement i'm sure uh, many of you all here are familiar with with if if you all are sort of of, of uh, been involved in climate change then the paris agreement is is a reasonably important uh, or landmark sort of, of of meeting where uh, a significant number of countries across the planet came together and for once agreed uh, on something and this was effective in in november 2016 what they agreed on was to keep the increase in global average temperature to well be below 2 degrees above pre industrial levels so it's saying that sort of or going back to the 1930s 40s sort of versus where we are today it's saying that from then to now we'll ensure that the temperature of the planet in no case sort of creeps above an increase of 2 degrees and what we will do is try and limit the overall increase to 1.5 degrees now how this report was put together it was essentially we had 224 of some of the top scientists across the planet to come together and this is from across the world so there's no biases in this there is whether it's it's the us or there's china or there's india they we've had representatives from most parts of the world in terms of the scientific community come together they ran through 6000 scientific publications spent 3 years to create a report that took into consideration 42000 odd expert government review comments uh, before it was finally blessed by governments and published by the intergovernmental Pal panel on climate change uh, this was done on the 8th of october 2018 now as you'd imagine to get a, so many sort of parts of of the world and governments in all of these parts of the world including the middle east and including uh, sort of of india and all of these countries to come together and actually agree on a finding and put it out is a mammoth effort which also means there's a lot of credibility to this particular publication uh, now essentially what the publication was trying to sort of answer was two specific things it the it the uh, sort of task was a to find out what happens to the planet when it warms up by 1.5 degrees versus 2 degrees so it's taken these two sort of numbers of of temperature increases and what it's saying is that we need to now sort of figure out what happens to the planet in these if the if the temperature of the planet went up by by this amount of of uh by by 1 and a half or to 2 degrees uh, and the second question that it was tasked to answer was how soon will we get there uh and the ipcc report essentially then breaks down these findings into a couple of very sort of tangible um understandable sort of of explanations and and i'm just going to run through that very quickly um so this is so so the first question to answer is what happens when we hit 1.5 versus 2 degrees let's start with the arctic ice uh, the arctic ice today is heating at 2 to 3 times faster than any other part of the world you saw that in that graph where i showed you sort of of the increase in temperature the the the, the top half of of the planet is actually eating much faster than the rest of the world now summers with no remaining arctic ice are 10 times more likely at 2 degrees than it is at 1.5 degrees which is essentially either once in a decade or once per century now that's the difference between that 0.5 degree sort of of difference in in temperature um the other very very concerning thing is that disappearing ice is connected to jet streams which uh, in turn cause weather systems to to get stuck in places for extended periods of time now what does that mean uh, from a scientific perspective the way that that the earth sort of of uh, weather patterns work is because we've got uh, the sort of of the arctic ice that that is and the area in on top of of the planet which is really cold every year the sort of hot and and warm sort of of ocean oceanic current that moves from the tropics they move upwards towards towards the arctic and because we've got really sort of cold zones in the arctic and there is ice in the arctic the cold sort of of uh, sea currents come and meet the hot currents and essentially those two things lead to jet streams that lead to the weather patterns across the world now one of the things that always that i used to always wonder wonder growing up was why is it that every year since i was a child 
the first of june monsoons used to hit kerala right it, and it's an amazing thing how does the how does the weather know that it has to land up every year the monsoon has to come and hit on the first of of june in a particular uh, sort of part of the world and that's because the world works in such great harmony everything in this world is connected and this ability and this connection is what allows for a lot of of what we see as predictable weather to happen as long as that predictability continues to exist weather patterns in across the world continue to sort of of then remain in a particular sort of pattern um, and any change to this pattern can lead to intense heat waves floods droughts and other extreme weather events what we've already found and what the scientists are telling us is that the volume of sea ice in the arctic has already declined by 70% in just 40 years it doesn't give us and that that 30% is is it's really worrying that all we have is that 30% and that could disappear really fast um the other big thing about the arctic ice and why it's so important is the arctic ice is also the home for for something called uh, permafrost and permafrost is essentially deep layers of ice it goes goes down many many sort of 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 meters deep into the sea now this ice has never melted it's been there since the dinosaurs it's been there forever uh, at least since since we've been able to have a lot of of the science tell us what what is there now the fact that it hasn't changed and it's been in that form for a long time also means that when it melts it's going to release a whole bunch of sort of inside this is trapped sort of stays trapped the whole bunch of methane and carbon dioxide which of course as it releases is going to continue to heat the planet but it also contains a whole bunch of dormant viruses and bacteria some of which they claim could have been the reason for the end of of various types of life forms in the past uh, now this melting ice is now starting to release a lot of those things into the planet in into into the atmosphere uh, and therefore limiting global warming to 1.5 degrees rather than 2 degrees is projected to prevent the thawing of an area of permafrost the size of mexico now this is these are really really important things this 0.5 degree sort of difference between one and the other can create a huge sort of imbalance on the planet as you can see uh, it also talks about extreme heat uh, this particular report has gone into a couple of things and and it it's also interestingly it's also talked about cities and and parts of the world that can be more impacted than others so extreme heat will be much more common worldwide with the tropics experience experiencing the biggest increase in the number of unusually hot days um extreme temperatures are expected to to increase by 1 to 5 degrees with a max with the maximum increase in coastal regions uh now india has about 7500 kilometers of of coast and and it's quite worrying to imagine that these the temperatures within this uh sort of these zones can change dramatically Uh, at 1.5 degrees about 14% of the entire population in the world is exposed to heat waves every 5 years now that increases by 37% if we move up to 2 degrees uh now this is this is even more sort of of critical from an india perspective because we've got a significant part of our of the population across the world resides here it also means the impact of this is far more sort of pronounced on on the people within uh sort of of this country especially the ones who don't have the sort of protection that many others do um the world's five warmest years have all occurred since 2015 with nine of the 10 warmest years occurring since 2005 so very clearly you can start to see these patterns this increase in carbon dioxide which is increasing the temperature of the planet which is then leading to these these weather sort of anomalies that we've never experienced in the past and that's increasing more rapidly year on year um there's a higher risk from heavy precipitation events including floodings and tropical cyclones of category 4 and 5 over the north indian ocean and near the arabian sea now this is in the report Cy the cyclone amphin was essentially a product of this if if you look at what's happened it started off as a category 1 storm and then as it picked up and went over the ocean the ocean had got to such a sort of of the temperature on top of the ocean and and the evaporation was so high that it started to pick up more and more moisture and by the time it made landfill in in sort of 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 uh, in bengal and and orissa it had achieved a category 4 and 5 sort of level and that's that's quite significant because it's scary you can imagine that every time now there's potentially a a, a storm that's likely to happen because of the increasing temperature of of the oceans that can quickly sort of of manifest and become uh, a category 4 or 5 storm now water scarcity and disease Uh, according to the report over 350 million urban people worldwide 
are likely to be sort of exposed to, to water scarcity at 1.5 degrees. That number moves up to about 411 million urban people sort of worldwide at two degrees. Um, farm stress, it's saying that, and, and as you can imagine, the lack of water, India is very, very sort of dependent on, on the rain for, for agriculture, uh, sort of as water scarcity starts to hit uh, sort of agricultural belts, it has a, a huge impact on Indian agriculture. Uh, at increased temperatures, the threat of humans uh, from disease such as malaria and dengue uh, are much higher, uh, as is the threat of people dying during climate-related heat waves, particularly in cities. And, and you can see that uh, it's, it's, it's already been happening uh, in various parts of the country. Uh, there was a recent assessment of the Himalayas, which essentially looked at the impact of climate change on on the on, on on the entire sort of, of Himalayan range, and what they found is that it at 1.5 at a 1.5 degree increase, that will lead to a melting of almost one third of all of the glaciers by 2100, um, or, and this is at 1.5 degrees. But if you take our current emission trajectory and and based on the amount of carbon we're currently releasing into the atmosphere, that number actually goes up to about two third of all of the glaciers across. Uh, sort of of that belt, uh, and this is really crucial because this is this is uh, perhaps the most important water source for 250 sort of uh, million people who, who dwell in the mountains, but also about 1.65 billion people who live downstream from from these uh, mountains because this river, many of these rivers actually sort of flow down uh, through a number of countries across the world, and that's the life source of of um, of many people. Uh, and as, as we sort of reduce it, it, you can imagine what that impact is likely to be. Um, as far as plants and animals is concerned, this report is saying that at 3.2 degrees, which is where our current trajectory is, we could lose almost 50% of, of insects and plants and about 25% of all vertebrates on the planet. Uh, as you can see in, in, in two degrees and 1.5 degrees, that number reduces, but it still is a significant number because when you're talking about even 6% or 8% or 4% of of insects and planets, that's millions of, of insects and planets across the planet. Um, there was a study that was done last year, which found that almost 90% of all seabirds currently have plastics in their stomachs. And that's compared to about 5% in, in 1960. Um, sea level rise in ocean acidification. Uh, there's a new 2019 study that says that oceans are warming much faster than scientists previously thought. About 93% of, uh, of of uh, global sort of, of greenhouse gases uh, of, of the uh, gas absorption happens in the ocean. So while the land is getting warmer, the ocean's getting much hotter. Uh, the oceans have a tendency to absorb a lot more heat than, than the land does. Uh, now this was interesting. According to, to, the, to that same report, it says the equivalent heating of detonating three to five nuclear bombs in the ocean every second is the amount of heat that we're releasing or that the amount of, of sort of, of heat that the ocean is capturing uh, year on year. 2018 was the hottest year ever recorded for oceans. Uh, the report goes back and in, and in the report it says that 90% of all coral corals will be lost at 1.5 degrees and over 100% of all corals across the planet will be lost at two degrees. Now, why, is, why are the corals important? The corals mm -hmm. and, and why does this happen? Uh, as carbon dioxide filters into the ocean, the ocean gets more acidic. As the ocean gets more acidic, the, the coral essentially has uh, an algae that sort of, of lives with it or sort of is planted on it that allows for the, uh, the, the coral to, to essentially look like what you can see on the left of that uh, sort of image. Uh, as it, the ocean acidifies, these, coral, these uh, algae basically release themselves from the coral and what you see on the other side is essentially the bleaching of coral, which then means that these corals find it difficult to survive. They start to bleach and eventually this coral, if, if it doesn't strengthen again, it will die. Now the death of coral also means that 30% of all fish on the ocean will get wiped out because they are all dependent on the coral reefs to sort of, of to get food and, and, and to be able to live. Um, it also sort of has a huge impact on fishing across the planet. Marine fisheries will decline by 1.5 million tons at 1.5 degrees and, and a two degree sort of loss will increase that to about 3 million tons. Now this is also super critical from, an, from, from the nutritional impact that it has on coastal cities, on, on sort of coastal people because a lot of people in, in the coast still very importantly sort of get their nutrition through, 
through the sea and through the fish in, in the sea. Uh, and this being wiped out has a, has a dramatic impact on their life. Uh, 69 million people worldwide impacted at 1.5 degrees and 80 million people worldwide at two degrees uh, on account of rising sea level. Now, coastal India is very vulnerable. The report specifically calls out Mumbai and Kolkata as, as very high for flood risk and the fact that that could start to happen on a much more frequent basis, in some cases, uh, even every year. Um, so, uh Ajay, before we proceed to that, I'm just going to interject here. I have a very, um, I mean, this is something that uh, is coming through, you know, listening to you put out all these numbers. Effectively, what we are saying is that in the last 50 to 70 years, with the adoption of modern technology and the absolute uh, faster pace of, tech, you know, industrialization that we've had post-World War II, we have accelerated the output of, of um, carbon dioxide, which is having this accelerated change event in the entire ecological system. That's effectively what I'm taking away from what you're saying, right? And Absolutely. because it's a very delicate balance, it is affecting everything from your marine ecology to your uh, you know, various geological zones to the polar ice caps, all of these are being affected, right? Correct, you're absolutely right. And, and, and you're right about the acceleration because and, and I'll, I'll show you just in, in, I'm getting to my uh, last two slides, but essentially what, what this means is that it took us, it took us about 40 years for the, for the global temperature to move up by 0.5 degrees. Mm -hmm. It then took us 20 years for the next 0.5 to sort of increase. So what you also see is by creating this sort of accelerated impact, it is also changing the way that, that it's not just the release of carbon, but the imbalance is also sort of, of creating a, a much more significant accelerated sort of impact on the planet. Yeah, so it's not just um, complicated, it is complex as well. There is not just dependency, but there's also multiple interconnectivity is what we're saying. That is correct. Yeah, please. Yes, just, just moving on to crops, which actually is, is very significant from an India perspective. Um, according to, to, to uh, the report, uh, it's saying that global crop yields are expected to be lower. And this is this essentially what it's saying is as, as it gets warmer, uh, sort of, of parts, especially parts of the tropics, will find it much more difficult to be able to sort of grow crops because these a lot of these crops are not conducive to those sort of temperatures. Uh, farmers in India are particularly vulnerable simply because there is a huge weather dependency on agriculture uh, and their ability to thrive. Over 60% of India's population or workforce is still involved in agriculture. And of 70% of, of, of that uh, in rural India depends primarily on, on agriculture for their livelihood. Um, as, as you can see from the migrant crisis, a lot of men end up going into urban areas and a lot of women are left to sort of, of manage, um, are, are left to, to, to essentially cope with, uh, with, with the sort of, of aggravated issues that are happening. But now the migrant crisis will even aggregate that more because you've now got uh, a huge sort of population moving back into potentially moving back into agriculture uh, in, an, in a completely sort of, of uh, uncertain uh, new world. Um, decreased food sort of availability as a result of projected dip in uh, sort of crop production, particularly maize, uh, rice, wheat, and other cereal crops increased nutritional uh, and sort of decreased nutritional quality of rice and wheat. Um, now this, this, is, this, was, uh, this is very recent, uh, thanks to sort of, of the cyclone Amphin, what we had was nearly 17,000, 1800 hectares of agricultural lands may have been damaged because of uh, salt water entering the seas um, in, in some of the farms, and this is in, in the Sundarban. So as you can see that it's not just something that is, is likely to happen, it's already happening today. We've already got a huge sort of, of challenge in, in, uh, in West Bengal and Orissa, especially in the Sundarbans, because what's happened is the salt water has now come in to their farms. And, and I was reading a report on this. It's quite scary because there is no chance that any of these people will be able to go back and cultivate these lands for many years to come because it's now filled with salt. Um, yeah. So just sort of, of, of the question of how long to this 1.5 degrees that we're talking about, I think this is where we are, 10 years, what we have to achieve even that minimum threshold, forget the 1.5 versus two degrees. 
in 10 years, we would have hit that sort of, of number of, of 1.5 degrees. Um, now, remember, this is, this is not just saying, let's wait for 10 years. Every year, year on year, things are going to get worse. So by the time we get to 1.5, there's already going to be a significant amount of sort of impact on the planet. Um, now, that, that, that movie that I started off with, which is the 2030, everything I've said now is exactly what the IPCC report is saying. Uh, the way we started this sort yeah. of thing around the movie is really in, in many ways in reality. Just coming to my lights, last slide on, 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 on the science, uh, it's while there's a lot of gloom in what I've said, the IPCC also talks about how perhaps we could mitigate a lot of this and ensure that we can remain at that 1.5 degrees rather than, uh, than, than the two degrees. Uh, it's saying that keeping the warming within 1.5 degrees will require reducing carbon pollution by almost 45% from the 2010 level. So if you look at 2010, we're, we literally have to get to almost half of that by the time we get to 2000 sort of, of 30. Uh, yeah. And if we want to reach zero emission, then by 2050, then that's the trajectory. So we need to, to really sort of, 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 of quite significantly reduce our carbon uh, emission. Now, steering the world onto such a, a pathway will require rapid and far-reaching transitions and deep emission reduction in all sectors. Uh, global power systems will need to switch to around 70 to 85% of renewables by 2050. Reduction of fossil fuels uh, use has to, with, with complete stop of coal by 2050. So it's saying that if we don't stop the use of, of burning of coal by 2050, we're in trouble. Uh, and all pathways, despite doing all of this, it's saying that all pathways limiting global warming to 1.5 will still require the use of carbon dioxide removal and negative sort of emission technology. So, so that's where we're at. Um, I'm gonna sort of hand it back to you. Sure. Thanks. Uh, so that was quite a, a sort of in-depth un understanding of climate science and thank you so much for that um it's led to a couple of very interesting questions and Abhay, i'd like you to uh, sort of jump in over here i'm going to bring all of this in with the legal aspect right um and we've already had people ask these questions uh, two of them let me start off with india does have a bunch of laws which are clubbed as an environmental law right we have uh, the Air Act, we have the Water Act, and subsequently a fair amount of uh, sub, I mean, sub, uh, subsequent legislation under it as well. Um, but very interestingly, do we have a law to protect soil, okay, or soil quality? That is that is a interesting question that that has come up, and and the reason I ask this is because based on what Ajay had has also brought out, you know, that there. Uh, there is hypersalinization of large tracts of arable land. There is reduced uh, fertility across uh, the, the world, um, especially in India. And that has a direct uh, relation to the output and which obviously is going to affect the ability to feed the billions that we have in this country. So that's one. The other is, um, you know, all of this is a, is a mega overview of climate as a whole. When we talk about the legal aspect of regulating it, the IPCC, the Inter Intergovernmental Panel for Climate Change, is, is uh, like an overarching sort of a web that the whole world has uh, collectively taken on to itself. What does it mean an actual policy, actual law for countries, especially for a country like India? So shall we start off with that, uh, Abhay, to begin with? Thanks, Suhasini. Uh... Also, thank you everyone for joining in here. Uh, I think now that uh, Ajay has done the hard work of giving us the, the scientific overview, my job becomes much, much easier. Um, before I respond to your questions, uh, Suhasini, and, and perhaps share a little bit more of what's on my mind, I do want to recognize uh, uh, both Priyanka and Manupatra for very, very boldly making a statement as a company uh, that is concerned about climate change and climate action. Uh, the audience that this event reaches out to uh, in that sense is quite significant. I also want to thank Suhasni Yu for uh, some beautiful conversations before we got into this conversation and a very, very generous uh, welcome uh, into an introduction. 
I've seen a few friends on uh, uh, the participant list from the Initiative for Climate Action. Just a quick shout out to them, Anjali, Sham, Vani, and Vedata. Thanks for joining in. My dear mother said she's going to catch this somewhere. So mom, if you're listening, hi to you. And let me proceed to, to your immediate uh, questions here. I think uh, when it comes to soil, India does not have a soil centric law. Yeah. Interestingly, uh, India does have uh, policy moves in the context of soil health. So right from the UPA regime, but continuing uh, over the last few years, we do have national soil health schemes that uh, have budgetary allocations. And this uh, falls within a mission from the central level called the National Mission on Sustainable Agriculture. One part of it is very, very explicitly focused on soil health. Um, of course, uh, the actual situation on the ground is uh, soil health testing has not occurred in the way that it should be occurring, but at least there is a, a machinery in place at the government level and there is a connection between soil health in India and uh, our larger international commitments under the Paris Agreement. As regards the question on uh, what does this mean for legal regulation? I think you're uh, going to take me to the heart of my comments here today. Uh, in a sense, uh, let's just again recognize where we are with the COVID pandemic, right? For, for the longest time, people were talking about the possibility of such a pandemic. We know of famous people such as Bill Gates who sort of predicted. Yeah. Uh, and wanted to, to do and what we were doing. But when the pandemic actually hit, for careful observers of the market, uh, there were few companies and few products and few services uh, that were well located to actually uh, benefit from uh, the opportunity that arose in the context of the pandemic. And one can just think of online learning, which has really, really taken off in a way that has not been seen over the last uh, five decades, if you wish, uh, simply because yeah. learning had to continue uh, in the context of uh, the pandemic. And early movers who had recognized that there is something in online learning really benefited from the gap or the opportunity that the pandemic created. Right. Second, uh, the pandemic itself resulted in a lot of uh, change in our uh, environment. You know, there are stories of uh, uh, now discredited, discredited, I beg your pardon, stories of dolphins uh, swimming in the canals of Venice. And we, of course, can all hear birds and uh, feel that the air is clearer. But uh, we can't really expect life to continue in a lockdown kind of mode. So emissions are going to again rise up and uh, that leaves open the question of what if anything are we required to do in a new way to continue to enjoy these things, birds chirping, animals coming back to uh, places where they've always been at, air being clearer, noise pollution going down, even people uh, having a, a sense of what's really important in life, connecting to your loved ones, spending time cooking and uh, uh, learning things, so on and so forth, right? So in that context, what does this mean for India? I think it's a question that uh, can be answered uh, by thinking of at least two phases. Ajay mentioned the Paris Agreement uh, 2015 that came into force in 2016. And under the Paris Agreement, but more generally under the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change, which is an international treaty from uh, way back uh, in 92, uh, India has made commitments internationally. We have at least three clear, clear targets. We are going to reduce the energy intensity of our GDP. So for every hundred rupees that constitutes our GDP, the amount of energy that was used in creating that 100 rupees is going to be reduced. And we've come up with a target uh, between 30 to 40%. We are going to uh, 
have a huge move towards renewable energy. Uh, and therefore, you've seen Prime Minister Modi already making some big moves when it comes to solar energy. That's why he was recognized by the United Nations Environment Program. And third, we are going to get a, a larger amount of land uh, that is covered by trees or forests because while lots of things are putting carbon into the atmosphere, uh, trees along with uh, water bodies are also taking carbon out of the atmosphere. What is referred to as sequestration happens in and through our forests, right? So these international commitments get retranslated into local policies and possibly laws as well. That's one part of what does this mean in terms of regulation. The second part in terms of what does this mean uh, for regulation is uh, bringing the justice lens very clearly on, right? As climate change occurs, uh, people get hurt. Uh, homes get flooded, businesses get uh, uh, their premises disrupted. Uh, what used to be a viable way of life uh, suddenly transforms, right? And uh, each of these things that happen when climate change impacts are felt from a legal sense amount to violation of rights or non-compliance of duties, right? Someone's right is being violated. Let's think of the uh, uh, sort of uh, struggling, vulnerable, uh, child-carrying uh, tribal women in the Sundarbans who now can't even grow the little rice in the small patch where she was growing rice and can't even live there, right? Uh, what's going to happen to her? She's probably going to end up on a street in Calcutta begging. And this, there is documented research that has drawn these connections uh, even from the earlier cyclone, Cyclone Isla, including women who ended up in Calcutta's red light district uh, simply because they had no other way of uh, sustaining themselves. So just at that level, but at every level, from individuals to communities to cities to uh, landscapes, uh, you are going to have damage which amount to rights violations. And the law basically has a role in either protecting those rights or when those rights have been violated, uh, providing for a remedy for the violation of those rights. So that's at a high level is how I would think of uh, the, what does this mean for regulation? The only point that I'll add is, Ajay gave you the key pathways that will be required to stay within 1.5 degrees or even to achieve two degrees, right? A, a huge transition to renewable, a huge move away from unsustainable uh, practices. Uh, you know, lots of things have to change very, very fast, right? And when things have to change very, very fast, that means uh, your business uh, and business production, your production practices. I saw someone had even raised a question about coal, uh, uh, your sources of energy procurement, all those things need to change. So. That is where a, a regulatory framework and lawyers have a key role to play. We are in that sense uh, capable of really, really getting the high level theoretical climate science translated into what this means for implementation on the ground. So uh, uh, before we continue, I think we can just run a quick second question on the poll. So for all our participants, there's going to be a, a second question that comes up for you right now. And we'd like to hear from you on, you know, what is, what is your sense now of climate change as well? So while, uh, while our participants look at that, it's interesting that you mention, um, you know, the translation of an overarching uh, law or an overarching global consensus, uh, such as the IPCC or the, the Paris Agreement, Kyoto Protocol, whatever we want to call it, actually translates into things like policies, regulations at a local level, right? Um, I think uh, this is something that we'd like to hear from both of you, actually. Um, you know, what do you think that there is a time that it is now time to actually start having conversations with the business houses, with the production houses, with manufacturing, um, with 
students with with citizens about understanding the environmental act, angle in your criminal liability in your corporate liability in financial penalties in regulatory challenges and you know i I'd, i'd like to hear a little bit about this from both ajay and you since uh, you know you both look at it from a slightly different perspective maybe uh, ajay you can just touch upon the business the financial even a pr angle to it right i mean eco friendly is has been quite a buzzword for the last decade or so but it's going to become a totally different level of um, sort of brand uh, usp now going forward so what is it that businesses need to be aware of in terms of a legal angle on this and then also abhay coming back to you subsequently with this about how do you think it plays out with like i said criminal financial all of these areas yeah sure so i i think from a business perspective i think it's a little bit of a no brainer for businesses as you go forward if if uh, if businesses at least the long term businesses i'm not talking about somebody who's looking at a two or three year horizon perhaps it's not impactful as as worrisome for them but most large corporations across the planet have started to really plan for the future in terms of a slightly disruptive future they're trying to prepare for it and say what can we do differently as this future starts to change how can we prepare our businesses for it i mean in many ways like like uh, we're seeing now with covid businesses are sort of of many of them are having to pivot to to change to see how they can do this now imagine what imagine we knew that this was coming right and and that's exactly what climate science yeah. is telling us it's telling us that we're going to have many covids coming to us in the years to come uh, and i think the the business community across the world has started to recognize that um, and interestingly uh, one one of the things that that you'll see that there is a concept of an esg which is essentially sort of of the concept of environmental social and governance uh, being a package that most large corporations are now starting to plan for and build into their business model so just just as an example if you look at the top pension uh, sort of of uh, funds across the planet and these are the biggest funds that invest whether it's the qatari fund or the sort of canadian pension fund or the japanese fund uh, the dutch fund all of these now put front and center put esg and the environment uh, as part of the of the diligence and part of of the need to understand uh, before they invest in a company what is your sort of 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 uh, how how does your future look from a environmental and a sustainability perspective so so this new buzzword of 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 what people used to talk about as sustainability has now become front and center in most business conversations because anyone yeah. who's looking at a 10 year horizon now has to ensure that their business is resilient and can cope with some of the damage hmm. that's coming our way so you do see a, a, i mean at some of those examples if you look at 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 uh, jeff bezos right he's 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 launched a 10 billion dollar climate fund now why would somebody who's who is the richest man on the planet start to plan and put money in in a climate fund unless he's really worried about about that future uh and equally whether that's bill gates or that's that's sort of of jack ma that there, there's there's another interesting sort of concept called the breakthrough energy ventures um this is essentially a conglomerate conglomerate, conglomerate of a bunch of sort of or of of big people whether it's it's um yeah. it's mukesh ambani whether it's it's bill gates it's bloomberg it's got branson in there it's got jack jack ma all of these people have come together and put put together a, a 1 billion dollar fund which essentially says let's let's start to invest in startups that are working in in the next sort of big technology for 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 ener- energy in the future because they're all really worried these are businesses that yeah. have to now sort of of prepare for that so i think there's a lot happening blackrock which is the biggest sort of of asset owner on the planet which has over 5 trillion dollars of of asset in funds has now said that esg is is critical so i think there is both internally in terms of your own businesses uh, there was recently sort of godrej came out and said that how how they were talking about how their own businesses are now starting starting to yeah. be, become more sustainable and i think you're starting to see that any company that's in there in this for the long term is starting to build a lot of these sort of capabilities and really recognize that this is the future and start to plan for that future perfect perfect so so that brings us to you abhay um i'm just want to sort of tweak that question over to you again uh given that in the last month itself we've seen uh, that the gas leak uh, in tamil nadu happened right and this is one of the bigger ones that has happened after bhopal right 
and we've had just so much of a change in legislation in the way corporate liability has been picked up in the way uh, you know community rehabilitation has been picked up subsequently um, keeping that in mind can you just quickly touch upon this the legal aspects of how um, how environmental law actually touches everyday life whether it is for a corporate whether it is for a citizen what does it mean what does what do community rights mean how do they actually tie in with environmental law in today's day and age thanks suhasni so i would actually like to quickly share my screen and and possibly respond to a couple of questions uh, that you have directed at me and several questions that i'm seeing in the q and a box as well mm. let's see if uh, my possible oh this is so let me know if the screen suhasni yeah. is visible yeah, yeah. okay Absolutely. awesome so so in, in one sense i think uh, sorry i'm having a little bit of trouble no playing worries. yeah okay so so in one sense i think uh, what i want to say first is that uh, mm, uh, the theoretical issues get sorted out by environmental science and environmental philosophy or climate science and climate philosophy whereas what this means at a material level that is what this means in terms of the energy that we have access to uh the resources be they water or food or even clean air uh that uh, are part of our markets or part of our supply chains uh the uh, opportunities in terms of how uh, we can either learn from someone or meet someone or get something from someone sell something to someone all of these things that in a sense are a uh, part of our regular life whoever we might be we might be a person uh, uh, in college we might be a a, a member of a, a neighborhood community we might be a, a farmer we might be a, a business that is looking to actually promote its products and services uh, whoever we might be the nature of how environment is connected to society means that uh the materiality of our daily existence is very very closely related to the health and the uh robustness of the planet or the environment of which and one thing that in a sense is is the safety valve or the defense or the uh clarifying uh, uh function in this relationship between what you saw is a very very complex story of ice degrees heat food rain uh insects animals uh virai all the things that ajay bought and the very simple questions of uh what should uh i do in terms of my own ability to access fresh vegetables or what should i do in terms of uh, my own interest in uh, uh doing something as a a lawyer who goes to court and argues cases that connection comes together and is in fact framed by something like a a legal perspective right so the law i'm going to have to get a little philosophical here but the but the law as as uh, the legal theorist joseph ras pointed out gives us reasons to do things or not do things right the law might be the one that tells us don't kill because if you kill you will uh be punished you could have your own life taken in a country such as india legally right or the law tells us something like uh, uh invest your uh, earnings in this way so that you get a tax benefit in that way right and so even in the context of climate change and in the context of environment more generally the law at least in the theoretical sense is supposed to give us reasons to act so if the legal system was working well uh, a high risk uh, 
enterprise or industry in a residential area that was operating without an environmental clearance would uh, be uh, punished. And uh, other people who were thinking about doing things in a similar way, operating either in a high risk way or coming back to climate change, operating in a way that was carbon intensive, that wasn't recognizing the actual future we are hurtling towards too, would uh, either through the hard hand of our criminal law or through the softer hand of uh, market-based solutions from our economic law, would get a signal from the legal system, right? And in that context, that is the space within which people who are thinking about change, uh, climate change, transformation and the law uh, have the most opportunity. We can recognize that in India, a lot of people break the law. Uh, in some senses, uh, uh, the poor and the vulnerable are not really protected by the law. If you have a lot of money, you can bribe the cops, bribe the lawyers and bribe even the judge, depending on where you might be. But uh, the system has a space of emergence. There is a possibility of it changing. Uh, everywhere you see success stories in Bangalore, the city where I live, because of lawyers, including Mr. Sham Divan, and because of a local community, uh, the Whitefield Rising community, a polluting uh, industry uh, was stopped, right? The National Green Tribunal was used. So I think my, I'll just take a couple of minutes here. My main point is we really have, as lawyers, law students, law teachers, uh, judges uh, of the future, we have a real role to play in the implementation element. Now, this is possibly my most important point uh, uh, throughout this conversation. Like in the COVID crisis, you might have seen that the industries and businesses that are actually surviving are the ones who are bold enough to take steps without saying, oh, I am shocked, I am paralyzed, I have no idea what to do. They can go, let's wait for two, three months, maybe the lockdown will be lifted. Right? Businesses, enterprises, even schools and colleges that have quickly pivoted, introduced digital transformation strategies, uh, thought of the possibility of new products, new services, are the ones that are surviving. Some of them are doing well. And in the context of climate change and the law, the transformative actors will be the one who thrive, right? The, one who act, the ones who actually believe that there is a new world that's coming and I have a role to play in that new world coming. Not that I'm going to just wait for the new world where suddenly everyone stops using diesel polluting cars and eats only sustainable food and all coal production is stopped, right? It's not going to automatically happen. It, there's going to be a transition to it. And in that transition, you're starting a clinic. You as a lawyer, taking on cases that speak to the community's need to shut down uh, a dirty polluting industry or, or save a river from pollution. You as a law firm servicing a, a, a business, uh, small or big, that is interested in sustainability. You as a teacher are really inspiring your students to connect climate, not only to legal methods in the first year of law school, but to jurisprudence, to constitutional law, to human rights law, to property law, to family law, to uh, natural resource law, to contracts, right, will play a role in that future world coming about. So you need to, if you want to thrive, have a slightly experimental, slightly entrepreneurial mindset so you can benefit from things as they are changing, right? Uh, I think, Suhasni, you mentioned, and Ajay also mentioned, that connectedness is at the heart of things and yeah. making those connections is really, really key. So I'll pass it back to you, Suhasini. I, I might have more to say later on the specific opportunities for specific people, but that's essentially sure. how I'd respond to your question. This is, this is really interesting. I think we've, we've um, come to a point where we are finally starting to recognize it is not about being a lawyer. It is not about being a, um, you know, botanist or a zoologist or a geologist. It is about being a, a, somebody who lives on this planet who needs to be very, very 
uh, aware of that and to be grateful of it and practice that gratitude in whatever way we can in our personal lives and in our professional lives. So that is effectively where, you know, climate action should probably lie. You know, that's what Greta Thunberg has been talking about. That's what Al Gore has been talking about. That's where it all comes down to. I think um, to, to come to the point where we are now, which is understanding how um, businesses can actually sort of start doing this as a business opportunity, how law firms can look at it. Ajay, I want to bring this back to you for a, uh, uh, for a quick um, little touch point over there. Can you just talk to us a little bit about what environmental law, climate science can mean today for especially the, the corporate legal professional uh, world, okay? When, when we talk about either servicing clients as corporate firms, litigation firms, or whatever else it is, what does, what does that actually mean? Sure, thanks. Uh, I'm just gonna go back to sharing my screen because I've got something I wanna talk about. Um, So I think just before we sort of uh, get into that, I think one of the things that uh, is just sort of, of useful to think about is that there are two parts of this. There is, uh, and, and let's let's start with the assumption that we still live in, in a capitalistic world. I, I saw some of those questions out there in terms of yeah. how do businesses continue to sort of exist like this. I yeah. Mean, yeah. The fact is, we're going to have to take everyone along, whether that's sort of of the social sector or that's the business or governments or all of that. I think as long as we continue to live in this realm, we need to find opportunity for everyone to move. But clearly yeah. we need them to transition from where we were, which is the use of fossil fuel. And this is more from a climate change perspective. Uh, if, if we were, had to talk about equality and we had to talk about a better world, there's lots of things we could change. But I think just sort of keeping this more specific to climate change and, and our sort of, of given what we, we know is the future. I think the, the opportunities really sort of come out of two specific types of things. One is, is, is the opportunity to mitigate because we, 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 the climate science is telling us, the IPCC is telling us, everyone's telling us that we need to move and transition into better ways of, of living our life. Uh, we need to move to sort of, of greener types of technology and, and methods. Um, but the other thing that is also very important is how do we adapt? Uh, and, yeah. and a classic case of that adapt uh, sort of of that adaptation, I think just sort of taking context in, in a recent context is again, say say West Bengal and and Amphan. Uh, the sort of, of of the state claims that it's lost close to about one trillion sort of rupees uh, in terms of of what the the destruction uh, has been to 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 the state. Uh, it also means that a number of businesses in that state have either been wiped out or have an inability to to restart because they really fractured at this point. Um, so to move all of that requires a different way of, of being able to cope. So there are two things. One is, is how do we build a world that perhaps will reduce the amount of sort of, of carbon that goes into the planet. The other is we know that we've already gone past a certain level and, and we're not going to be able to stop before 1.5 at least, uh, which also means that these events, as they happen, we also need to start planning for them. So from a business opportunity perspective, I think what, what, um, Again, what, what a lot of the economics is telling us is that there is almost a $90 trillion requirement of global investment in low carbon uh, sort of, of climate resilient projects uh, by, by 2030. So it's saying that in the next 10 years, we need to pump almost $90 trillion into the global economy to be able to compact, sort of combat climate change. Uh, and it's saying that India needs about $3, $3 trillion of that. Uh, the IFC has actually come out with a report that has talked about some of these opportunities and where these specific opportunities lie. So it talks about in the context of, of, of about six or seven specific types of things. But if you look at it, all of these are very close, closely linked to, to being able to reduce carbon in the overall mm -hmm. context. So renewable energy, it's saying that's just close to $500 billion of investment. Uh, climate smart agriculture is, is close to about $200 billion. We've got sort of... of uh, waste management, electric cars. I mean, the original sort of plan of 2030 would have taken us to about $670 billion of, of potential investment in EVs. But yeah. of course, the government has changed that policy now. Uh, transport infrastructure is about $250 billion. Green buildings, and that's, that's a huge, I mean, many of us don't recognize how much of our carbon footprint is linked to our own living yeah. spaces. Um, 
and i think sort of of transitioning to better more sustainable living is 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 perhaps the need of the art and uh, we still haven't moved very far in that so there's lots of potential investment in that area urban water uh, there is a city like bangalore that after cape town have been sort of declared as as perhaps the most sort of of um, i mean uh, it, it is worrying for a lot of people who live here and yeah. actually sort of uh, understand it it is very worrying so there's a lot of potential investment in in that space um the other thing that's become quite sort of big in across the planet is something called green bonds green bonds are essentially sort of of linked to to sustainable investment uh i think it was yes bank that that released india's first uh, sort of 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 green bond uh, a couple of years back um but the world market for green bonds is close to almost 260 billion uh, at at the moment and that's if if you see where we were literally just 5 5 years ago it it, it was 30 34 billion uh clearly the world in the last couple of years has dramatically recognized the the need to shift to this new future and that yeah. of coming out through through some of the potential investment uh that's that's out there uh just in terms of law firms i think uh it's quite interesting so i'm and and i'm going to sort of share a little bit of a personal story here when when i uh, back in 2007 when and and eight when when i uh, set out to uh when i set up the employment practice at uh, at the firm uh, that i was in uh, tri legal uh no very few people maybe one or two sort of large firms across the country even had an employment practice most people believed that we didn't need need it uh but what started to happen was every international firm out there already had these sort of practices and were sort of of these were practices that were thriving in in other parts of the world i think what very often happens with india is we tend to ape a lot of what happens uh, and sort of follow a lot of of trends that happen in the western world and then it starts to become something that we want to quickly sort of pick up um it's been unfortunate but so far in india i haven't seen any sort of significant law firm that's that's really sort of started to look at climate change seriously and build out a practice uh however green law a significant part of the international sort of most of the big firms across the world so if you look at linklaters if you look at dla piper if you look at baker mckenzie you yeah. know white and case these are all top notch law firms every single one of them now has a climate practice uh, now what does a climate practice essentially involve uh, it could be a bunch of different things but if you look at it each of the sub practices within practice areas within firms have the ability to work on on climate related things so if you yeah. banking and finance the whole sort of carbon trading green bonds sustainability loans uh, climate finance these are big in the project and infrastructure space india is already a, a global leader in the renewable sort of space so so that's that's a more evolved practice you'll actually see that in many sort of uh, pretty much all firms across india already uh, but things like smart cities mobility water waste management these are emerging areas uh, real estate with green buildings and energy efficient technology that's that's a big opportunity for for law firms um in the corporate space obviously the mna mna and, and investment sort of potential in sustainable businesses uh, funds have now very st seriously started to sort of of take into consideration esg and impact investment you're starting to see a lot more impact investment sort of of firms in 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 india now start to put their money and say that we want to invest in in the future like this uh, technology uh, i think very clearly we've seen from some of the earlier sort of things how critical technology is in the context of of our ability to to manage carbon going forward um insurance that's a big big one across the world insurance companies are recognizing that there is a huge threat to their own businesses on account of climate change because a lot of them haven't sort of of built in sort of of preparation for that they haven't carved out issues around climate change and they quickly starting to pivot so you'll actually see that that many insurance companies are actually taking climate change very seriously in their own sort of understanding of yeah. it and the way they building out policies because uh, it's still all under act of god and and it's no longer an act of god it's definitely an act of man that's happening so absolutely and, and that's interesting right because there's actually litigation now that's starting yeah. to evolve across the planet that is going into that specific thing saying that listen you you can't sort of of, of look away from something like this there's very clear whether yeah. it's the fossil fuel companies there's a whole bunch of litigation behind them that sort of of, of chasing them now to to pay back for what they've done um but essentially that's that's where we're at i think philanthropy and and csr increasingly you're, you're starting to see big sort of of names put money behind that um and i think the key to to this and and perhaps for this audience as well is the big advantage i think for for young lawyers is 
I think the ability to really appreciate uh, climate change and what it means to, I mean, I suspect that that by the time a lot of this really pans out, most of the people on this call are going to be in, in their 40s, in, in, in their late uh, sort of, actually perhaps in their, in, in their yeah. 30s. Uh, and that's really worrying because you're going to be at the prime of your life if the world has changed so dramatically and it becomes difficult to, to sort of uh, work. It's good to prepare. It's good to start building out these uh, things. And I think there's there's a huge opportunity to start building out these practice areas in India. Um, so that's where we're at. I just, so Hasni, if I can just take one more second and, and just sort of show you one lovely, lovely sort of infographic. I, I wanted to show, show this to you all uh, before, but it's, it's my favorite sort of piece on climate change. Uh, and it really tells us a lot about where we are today. So this is, this is by Down to Earth, which is arguably one of India's most fantastic sort of publications on, on, on the environment. Uh, and then their data is really, really good. So this, this is what they've done. They've taken the last close to about 100 odd years of, of, um, of different- You can't see it, Ajay, sorry. I, I, have you put it, pulled it up onto your screen? Yeah, you, my screen is not showing now. No, your screen is showing, but right now we only see law firms. Oh, I'm so, so just give me a second. Let me, let me uh, take it back to the screen I want. Uh, can you see this? Yes, now we can. Yeah, so, so this is what it is. It's, it's the down to earth sort of publications uh, and, and, and it's, it's talking about extreme weather and it's essentially saying extreme is the new normal. And what it's done is it's basically sort of benchmark all of the really sort of big, uh, events that we've had in terms of, in this is India specific, right? So it talks about from all the way from the 96 sort of, of 1896 crisis on, on drought, where it talks about the number of people and things. And as you move up this, this chain, you, you get into 1920, the 1930s, all the way up to independence. And then we get to the industrial era. By about 1950, 1960, we've started to hit industries and, and fossil, and we're essentially now starting to release carbon into the atmosphere. Now, this is where it gets really interesting. As you move up this, you start to see these bubbles, right? We've got floods, landslides, we've got storms, and, and this is moving up. We're keeping on going. We're reaching the year 2000. You see those, you see how this balloon is increasing, Absolutely. right? And you come yes. up to, to where we are today, and you talk about the floods in, in Uttarakhand, in, in West Bengal, in Kerala, and all of these. So clearly, I mean, for me, this, yeah. this uh, was stark sort of, of reality of, of where we are today in, in terms of of some of these things and it's uh it's 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 amazing that we it, this still hasn't become mainstream in, in our own understanding of it the fact that this is there's a very clear yeah. like said, there's a cause and effect it's not an act of god anymore it's clearly an act of of what we've been doing to the planet uh and it's starting to come back and sort of bite us in 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 many many really terrible ways um so i think it's it's critical i think for the lawyers out there yeah. for people who are looking at this in whatever format of of career it is whether in the social space or in the government space or or even away from the law. Um, whether we yeah. like it or not, the opportunity is going to increase for everyone within this space. We just need to find a voice and a way to sort of make it come through in some ways. Brilliant. Thanks so much for that. Before we just uh, move to the last couple of comments before we... We're going to run the last and the third uh, poll question for the rest of our participants here. Um, as it comes up, we'd, be, we'd you know, like to hear from you about this. Um, and uh, yeah, so just to sum up what we've been discussing so far, it's interesting to know that, uh, you know, the, the almost 89% of everybody who's attended has now re responded saying that, yes, climate does matter to them and climate science is something that's going to keep them uh, sort of engaged so it's interesting to know that this conversation is already starting to have some impact right um, I think it's important for us to just pause for a minute and let people accept and realize that look every act and every action is not going to be a, a, a very sort of glamorous Erin Brockovich moment in, in your life, right? Uh, from a career perspective, it's going to be these incremental small actions, big actions, whatever you do, which overall add to protecting and, and creating a more sustainable world for all of us to live in, right? Well, I mean, um, we've, we've got fantastic role models in India with, you know, Mr. MC Mehta, with Ritvik Datta, with 
Vandana Shiva with Ashish Kothari and, and all of these people who've been doing this phenomenal work for the last two, three, four decades. So it's important because we've got a lot of questions, you know, from our attendees today also about how can I associate with climate change? How can I associate with ICA? How can I, uh, as a lawyer, as a young student, as a practitioner, as an educator, what does it mean? And it was lovely to hear that it's not just the, the decisions that the big brand and the big companies make. It's also working on these transactions, working on various different fields of law, which all have at some point of time a touch point with how this makes our world uh, you know, less vulnerable and, and a healthier place to live in. I think uh, it's good to sort of bring it all back in, uh, you know, as, as we near the end of our conversation for today to sort of understand, uh, I'll bring it back to you, Abhay. I'd like to hear from you. Uh, what do you see as the immediate, say, two or three points that students especially and, and uh, sort of young lawyers and, say, educators can do to be directly engaged with climate science? science, climate change, climate action, especially in the, let's say the legal profession, since we all happen to have that connection uh, individually as well. Thank you. So I think the most important thing is to continue doing exactly what you're doing today, which is participating in conversations and showing up. So uh, I really think there's great, great, great uh, value and possibility in collaboration and in working together uh, as a observer of the environmental space for close to two decades now, one of the biggest problems uh, when it comes to environmental law or environmental protection is everyone is doing things but without really connecting with the other. And there is of course a huge gap of available information that doesn't allow people to figure out how they step in and, and do something useful, right? So that's partly the, the reason why the Initiative for Climate Action was set up. We want to create possibilities for people to actually learn and to connect with each other and do useful things. Mm, I think uh, the sky's the limit in terms of what one can do immediately. I mean, if you are a student in a law school and uh, you're thinking of what you can do, maybe you can start a journal on climate change law. There is not a single journal on climate change law in India. And there are a few such journals uh, in other parts of the world. It will be useful. You'll also be a pioneer. Maybe you can uh, start a clinic uh, or a clinical kind of activity in your law school or law college that actually works with people and communities who are impacted by climate change. Maybe, not maybe, you should definitely ask your teachers difficult questions in the classroom can you please relate what you're saying to climate change? Because uh, if our teachers uh, uh, don't have an opportunity to learn and if they're not challenged, they're not going to influence even more students, right? Mm. Uh, as students, you can certainly connect with the, I think Suhasni's point is very well taken. There are people and there are organizations doing fabulous work and uh, just reaching out and connecting to them, offering your help, even doing small things like uh, getting some research work done or, or sharing uh, news on your social media handles, that makes a difference. And once you get into this way of thinking where uh, you don't have to figure it all out in advance, but once you're open to engaging, uh, if uh, uh, things work the way they should, a lot more opportunities become visible to you. So it just requires that first step of putting your hand out and saying, uh, I'm willing to uh, be part of this. Uh, for me, I think young lawyers uh, and uh, teachers are, are really at the heart of possibility when it comes to transforming the system. As a, as a lawyer, even if you're a, if you're a litigating lawyer, uh, there have been questions on, on climate change litigation. Be aware that uh, climate change litigation is real and exists in India today. There have been people, including Ritwik Tata, uh, who was mentioned, who have gone to the NGT on behalf of a young girl, Ridhima Pandey, talking about the need to do more for climate change. Across yeah. our high courts, uh, petitions are being launched, right? Uh, 
every environmental NGO worth its name is interested in going to court because there is a sense that court is the only thing that works uh, in India. The government sometimes is too slow or not responsive and the parliament is too diffuse, right? Uh, there is a desperate need uh, for lawyers and you don't have to be an environment law specialist. You don't even have to be a litigating lawyer. Even if you are a lawyer specializing in capital markets or uh, what have you, mergers and acquisitions, uh, your legal mind can really advise people on, on a legal strategy, including an NGO. And, and last point to mention, mm, there is a huge, and I'm returning here to what uh, Ajay said uh, at the start of our conversation, there is a huge policy uh, opportunity space, right? Because India has really set up an elaborate uh, architecture to respond to its commitments under uh, the Paris Agreements. There are eight national missions. There's a national action plan. Every state has a state action plan. States are formulating water plans. But like with many other sectors, the capacity is simply not there in the government, right? Uh, the city of Delhi outsourced all of its planning to a consultancy, one of your ENY or PWC type consultancy. So the government has said it's going to do something. It has even come up with budgetary allocations and created a, a structure, but the capacity is not there within the government. And this is where uh, lawyers can really contribute usefully and also get a, a very, very steady stream of income uh, into their uh, uh, earning portfolio, right? It might not be the only thing you do, you might be practicing civil case regularly. You might be volunteering outside of your law firm job, but you can contribute capacity-wise at every level of the governance architecture. And believe me, you, it will be super valuable and it will be super welcome, but you will have a little bit of initial difficulty in how do I actually land that opportunity? How do I tell someone that I am going to help, right? And, and that brings me back to the need for a slightly entrepreneurial, slightly proactive mindset. You'll have to take a few no's, but you will find your yes and you will find that open door. So that's that's absolutely phenomenal. You know what, I'm, it just it reminds me of my own journey. I, I Like I said, when we were discussing, right? I started off uh, in law, with the hope that I'd end up practicing environment law at some point of time. But, uh, you know, but interestingly, it is that I, I, I will say that in my own personal journey, I have come across this touch point in, in a most fascinating set of circumstances from urban planning to transportation to healthcare to even security, right? Um, all of it has at some point of time been directly related to the natural world that we inhabit and how it affects us. And I think lawyers are particularly well-placed to deal with a situation like this because um, a good legal education sort of gives you the ability to take in information, process it and apply it to problem solving, which is unique, which is different from merely looking at facts or data as such, right? So, um, I think it's it's been a fabulous conversation, uh, you know, with both of you. Thank you so much for your time today for this, you know, fantastic conversation, which has given us an overview of not just climate science, but also the, the legal and the regulatory impact that it has on our country today. And also how, you know, the, 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 the profession should look at it or can look at it. And, uh, you know, any last thoughts that you might have before we wrap up, it would be good to hear from both of you. Um, I, I just think, thank, I mean, firstly, I just want to sort of thank everyone for put, putting this together. I think so a lot, lot of what you said, I, I really think that we're at a time where this is, this really is, it's not just imperative that we sort of get involved, but it's, it's also an opportunity. It's an opportunity like, like nothing uh, we've had before. Uh, and I think like Abhay was saying, I think it's the ability for people to connect. And I think this is, this is perhaps a, a, a good segue to, to, to start to make those connections. I think whoever you are, wherever you are, I think start to connect with people around climate change. Yeah. Start to have these conversations. And, and the more you start to have these conversations, the more 
sort of avenues will develop around how you can solve this problem. So, so thank you again. Uh, it was great Absolutely. being on this. Likewise, likewise. Yeah, my uh, my last words would just be that uh, mm, join the movement uh, and uh, let's let's hope that uh, India does have some super strong climate laws in the near future. As Ajay said, we're not talking hundreds of years. Uh, things are really going to get hot, uh, and pardon the pun there, in the next 10 years. It's begun. Uh, so, so great laws of India, such as the Right to Information Act and the Forest Dwellers Act, began by people talking to each other and, and coming together. Right. So I see the possibility of even a, a dedicated climate law for India in the near future. And we certainly will be doing our bit to, to make such things happen. Thank you, everyone, for all the energy you brought into this. Thanks. So uh, thank you all for an informative session and speaking personally for myself and enlightening one at that. And I'm sure of course the conversation we heard today, many amongst us will start to actively think about making a positive contribution. Thank you all who joined us today afternoon. Uh, the link will be emailed to you with the recording and it'll also be available on the YouTube channel. So thank you and have a very good evening. Thank you, everyone. Bye.